Good afternoon. It's Culture on Court and it's happy hour. I just want to take a brief moment, first of all, to acknowledge uh, the service of our, our, of our veterans on both sides of the border. It's Veterans Day and Remembrance Day. So if we could just have a brief moment of silence. All right. Welcome everybody. Today's panel day. I'm so excited to see everybody. Let me make some formal introductions. First of all, we have a special guest joining us. Her name is Katie Dinnan. Hi, Katie. You're the assistant lecturer at the University College Cork and your senior associate at the Minson Group. And just recently, I read a publication that you wrote about why resilience isn't the answer to coping with challenging times. And so we're going to come back to that shortly, but let me make some more formal introductions. We've got Patrick Sells, uh, who is the CIO at Quantic Bank, and he's the digital banker of the year, according to American Banker. And we've got Hilton Barber, and he's a marketing wizard who operates under the intersection of strategy, culture, and purpose. And then we've got the great Lauren Rubis, my business partner and retired CPO with the great business hat there. And of course, myself, Lisa Patrick, welcome to Culture Uncorked, the panel discussions. You know, I was so going uh, to wear Patrick's hat that he sent us, but it didn't show yeah, up. I know. Area. So uh, this is a tribute to you, Patrick. I think it's Thanks, the Lauren. same love, place it's a as your pattern. bottle of wine. Yeah, I, I think, I think yeah. it's stuck in that same place. <laughs> they're, on, they're on their way all around the world. Exactly. South Africa, exactly. Canada, Ireland. So Patrick, um, you've introduced us to the wonderful Katie. So tell us a little bit of a story about how you two got to know each other so well. And I know there's a connection there with the Mitzen group because you sit on their advisory on their advisory board. Um, but tell us a little bit more about the story behind the two of you and how you met. Yeah, so I, I started working with the Mizzen Group, which is a uh, boutique reg tech uh, firm here in America, works with uh, banks, I guess, really around the world. Um, and in conversations with them, really started thinking about this idea of compliance and innovation being symbiotic. And so they connected me to Katie um, to help kind of actually bring some real thought and thinking to the ideas that I have. And um, so that Katie and I connected and really been one of the uh, highlights of the year. And one of the things I think in this time of COVID, we can look to find things to be grateful for and how much easier it is to begin to build friendships on Zoom, right? You don't even think about it. And so, you know, Katie and I became friends very quickly and just started having a lot of great conversations and realized uh, she's a lot smarter than me. So therefore I should talk to her as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how you're going to from that, but anyway. <laughs> so Katie, tell us a little bit about your work. Um, sure. So um, I guess I split my time 50-50. Um, so as you said, I'm an assistant lecturer at UCC um, and I'm based in the philosophy department. Um, and I lecture, um, last term it was on political philosophy, um, which was interesting given the election we just had. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the term before it was on moral responsibility. And my research interests, broadly speaking, are, um, I guess, in the intersection between what I would see as vulnerability and autonomy. And um, so I'm interested in all these ideas of agency, about these strong, powerful ideas about how we take ourselves to be free um, and how we take ourselves to have agency and to be potent within the world. Um, but also how we're all vulnerable and we're all human beings. We're all vulnerable in many different ways. Um, so about a year and a half ago, um, I was contacted by UCC um, and they had a project um, by the Mizzen Group to look at culture um, and to look at um, sort of how to measure culture. Um, and Mizzen, and I have to say, um, I'm so lucky <laughs> that I got this call um, because Mizzen, they, they really are like very interested in interdisciplinary work which is yeah. so fantastic, right? Um, as a philosopher, I get to meet people like Patrick and get get to meet people like you and talk about culture in financial services, which is just 
like mind blowing for me, you know. Um, so UCC um, put me in, they, they kind of got together this team at UCC. Um, so they have um, like a world renowned behavioral scientist and he's a behavioral economist and he works with them and he works with me too. And um, we both work on their diagnostics about this idea about how to measure culture. Um, and as part of that, Miz and we're working with Patrick um, and they put me in contact with Patrick. And um, I think we've formed a mutual admiration society, Patrick. <laughs> so um, I have to say it's it's been great. So that's my kind yeah. of trajectory here. Katie also is a uh, raises chickens. Oh, fun fact. <laughs> fun. No, that's a fun side. Yeah. Fact. <laughs> I don't know if I'm embarrassed that this has come up, but I do. I love my chickens. <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot really well with my friend who she's got uh, some chickens as well, and, and she loves her chickens too. <laughs> Is there a Kantian connection there? Because I know that you're saying, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the story behind the chickens, Katie? <laughs> do you know what? I think there might be. Um, so I think people... It's not my view of Kant, but people view Kant as this kind of like cold hearted um, philosopher, someone who denigrates the emotions. Um, and I suppose my chickens don't really need me in the way a dog might or love me. And I, I quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Some people would get a fish because that would probably be the only easy to handle. <laughs> Yeah. Very good. Well, I would say then that you've really, truly found a place where you belong. Yeah. I, I do, I think. Yeah, I'm very lucky. Yeah. 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 So that, that kind of gets me started with, I, I'm, we're going to do a little uh, game here. And we're going to, I'm going to say a word and then we're going to go around the table and everybody's going to tell us, tell our viewers what that word, specific word means to you. Okay. So the first word we're going to do is belonging. And Katie, I'm going to get you to start. Okay. Um, I suppose belonging for me means home um, in a way. Um, I feel I belong most at home. Um, maybe it's different when you, you take it to the work environment. Maybe belonging looks slightly different there. But when I think of belonging, I, I think of kind of the intimacy of home. Patrick? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, interesting in, in, even hearing Katie's answer um, I approach it so differently because I moved about every two years and so I don't really know what home is right I think belonging is you know what comes to mind is a sense of a deep sense of almost like tranquility peace of acceptance right and the, there's, a, there's a lack of anxiety when I feel I belong Mm, that's a good one. Hilton? I'm going to, you know, so like Patrick, I've moved around a bit. Um, so there is that, that sort of sense of where is home. You know, there's an idealized version of what is home. Uh, I've been in Canada now for almost 20 years, but can you say, is this home for me? Depends on the day that you are. If it's the middle of winter, then no, it isn't. I wish I was back in Africa. Um, but the reality is, I think that that sense of warmth and comfort and acceptance is at the core of it. I would add that because of that warmth and that comfort and acceptance, it gives you the confidence to be you. So, because you have those things that you're wrapped in, you can have the confidence to be yourself. And I think again, if you if you belong. And you probably have a heightened sense of confidence too. At least the confidence to be yourself. Yeah. Mm. Lauren? Yeah, you know, as you know, we've been doing a lot of work in this. And um, it's uh, for me, it, it connects most of the word home too. It, it's, um, it's an emotional outcome um, of lots of things. And the subsets of it that we're finding is that when you feel really connected, that there's a sense of welcome and acceptance. And then there's also this notion of contribution. You know, like you make a difference, you're a difference maker, you're, you're, and then I think there's sort of clarity around how you really connect to the people around you, the purpose around you. So it's all those dimensions for this wonderful emotional outcome that I think happens when you really feel like 
uh, you belong, that you're really at a place that we should be. And I think it's an increasingly, obviously, important word. We obviously feel that way. And um, yeah, what about you, Lisa? What do you think? Of, how do you think about it? Well, for me, it is, it, for me, it's a deep, deep sense of connection, right? Connecting to anyone and, and everybody that's in, in my life, um, at home and at the workplace. Um, and it's, it's really about fostering a feeling of love. Um, that's what, what connection to me is. And, and love can be different. It doesn't have to be a, I'm in love with you, but uh, just a real sense of deep connection where I know that no matter what I do or say or who I am, that I'm loved and that I'm I'm accepted. So that to me, that's what belonging means. Yeah, you know, I was curious. Um, it's an emerging word, and and uh, and you know, we like shiny new things, and I'm hoping that it doesn't become uh, just a buzzword. But I was curious around this research study. Half a million people just recently published, and they they looked at around 167 different countries, I think, and of the values that were most cherished, belonging was number four. And actually, quite. Obviously, I was pretty happy to see that, but I was, I guess, a little bit uh, surprised. Actually, I don't know what anybody, what everybody, what, you know, what anybody else's reaction to that. You know, why, why do you think that was the case, and, and um, just what your thoughts are on that? Lauren, are you surprised it was that low or that high? No, I was surprised <laughs> actually, Patrick was that high. Really, mm -hmm. I, I was interested that that was a word that was picked up yeah. in such a cross-cultural kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, that that you know sometimes there's a possession kind of or a colonialism that's attached to the word. Yeah, and I was worried that it wouldn't translate across cultures the same way and that kind of stuff. But generally, it really seems to be a very solid, a uh, right there in the top of of this sense of what we want as human beings, uh, the sense of being being accepted and being part of and our true authentic self. So, well, yeah. What about you? Are you surprised it was that high or that low? Or You know, as you know, I'm deeply fascinated by the power of words and language. Yeah. And, it's used. and I think what stood out to me immediately was it's a word that I can't recall in the last conversation that it would have come up naturally outside of talking to the people here on this call. So yeah. I, don't think, I don't think it's a word commonly used in, the, in our vernacular, but yet there's something about it that elicits an emotion still, yeah. right? So in that maybe kind of tension there, the fact that it came in fourth kind of feels right, I suppose. And one sense I would have been surprised to make the list at all, because it's not something I think people naturally yeah. would love to hear. And on the other hand, you know, you would think you hear that, you're like, yes, I want to belong. Right, yeah. I want the feeling. And yeah. by the way, the person that set that research study up is no one other than Kelvin Harvard right here, who is always at the leading edge of so much of this stuff. So thank you for sharing that study. I thought it got quite a, quite a reaction on LinkedIn, actually, and maybe other places as well. What, what do you think about it, Hill? I mean, Lorna, I think my reaction is similar to Patrick and yours, which is delighted to see it there, maybe surprised that it was there. Um, but I think if you if you take a moment of reflection, it, it it kind of strikes me as one of those words. That, you know, in in marketing terms, we always talk about this notion of laddering. You know, where you you may you may start. You know, in in marketing terms, with we, you know, we create a great bowl of soup, and then you start laddering. Well, a bowl of soup makes you connected to your to your children. And when you're connected to your children, you feel a sense of community. And when you're connected to your community, you know, you can achieve anything. And you, we've all seen those advertising that starts with, how did a bowl of soup become an antidote for world peace? You know, how did this bowl of soup suddenly equate to world peace? Because marketing people, we tend to do that. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I suppose I wonder if in the research we weren't getting a bit of laddering. You know, when you ask people, do you feel content? Do you feel, do you feel at peace? Do you feel confident? Do you feel safe? Yes, 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 yes. So what do you feel? I feel I'm at a place where I belong. Okay, good. If I'd asked about belonging at the beginning, you would have said, 
what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, maybe right. Now that I got there, you go, of course, it's because I belong. Yeah. And I wonder if that, again, you know, Kate, Katie is our resident expert by a country mile on research and doing it properly. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure Katie has a, a perspective on whether this was good or bad. Sure. I haven't read it, um, but you said it was done by someone at Harvard, was it? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think this was somewhere else. I, I, okay. I the source right now. Um, do you okay, know? okay. Um, so the things that would spring into my mind as a researcher, um, the first thing is, how is the term defined? Um, mm -hmm. So that would be the very first thing I, I'd want to see, is how they're defining the term belonging. Um, and the second thing I'd want to see is, were the terms defined for the participants that took part in the research? So were they all clear on the same kind of idea of belonging before they answer the questions? Because otherwise it would be sort of like comparing apples and oranges, right? And they wouldn't be talking about the same thing. But to be honest, any researcher worth their salt should be doing that, you know? Um, and Hilton, to answer your question, that sounds very much like what I think of as priming. Um, mm -hmm. So that yeah. they prime someone to answer in a particular way and to be honest that's like one of the reasons I love working with Mizzen is they take all of those kinds of things into consideration when they're actually making their diagnostics and to make sure that the questions are asked in such a particular way that it doesn't amount to priming because as a researcher actually you don't just want <laughs> to get the answers that it might seem like you want right that's mm -hmm. not what you want. What you want is truth, if you can get at it. Um, and yeah, so yeah. there's been such a history of methodological research on how not to do that, um, that if the researchers were any good, which I presume they are, um, you wouldn't have, you shouldn't have that problem, you know? And if it's peer reviewed as well, which means that it, it goes through, you know, peers and, and other academics will say, well, no, come on, you ask that question. Just before you ask that question, what do you expect? <laughs> so if it's published like that, you can, you should be able to trust it, you know? Um, so they would be my thoughts. You, you see why she's smarter than me? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I mean, so, so Katie, I, you know, obviously I agree 100% with everything that you've just said. I think considering this this forum and the fact that it's uncalled Wednesdays, I think I was just delighted to see it. You know, there was part of me that said, Katie, you're absolutely right, but I'll still take the win. You know, I'll yeah. take the list. I don't care how it got there. I don't care if they fudged it in at the end. I'll just take it. That's the win. Yeah. Like, guys. It's interesting when we when Lauren and I first started talking about belongify, we actually the belongify wasn't belongify, was it Lauren? And we really wordsmithed around, and so Patrick, you'll appreciate this, because it was advanced word first when we looked at belongify. And I said, that doesn't make sense. Yes, we're advancing forward, but when we say belong, we don't need to explain to anybody, and help me appreciate this from a marketing perspective, people know what belong is. And so we don't need to explain what belong, belonging it or belongify or advanced word is it's because people already know the default because we have to educate people on that particular word. And everybody will have a version of it, of what they believe the sense of belonging is, but it will make it very easy to create belongify from it. So Lisa, can I ask, you know, you know, directly to you and Lorne, I mean, because, you know, knowing Lorne's pedigree and his desire to make genuinely a global impact i mean i wonder about you know that at the heart of that word the emotion at the heart of that word if it resonates to the same degree globally you know and again that was part of what i think we were all attracted to by this piece of research it said you know whether you're in the united states or you know argentina or australia you know by and large you all kind of put belonging in in that top five bucket. But yeah, I, yeah. Lorne, in terms of, does it have, have the same heft in in other cultures? Yeah, and I, you know, and I, and, I, and really, um, this is the first look that I had in assuming, like Katie's point, that there's integrity behind the research that seems to indicate that it transfers, that it's very ubiquitous, that is a human condition. And, you know, it's one of the really interesting things about why I was so curious about Katie when I started to read her research, even though 
Katie, I don't. I think you're only early days around if you're going to continue to do work around belonging. But your piece around just the whole moral um, uh, moral issue and the issue around vulnerability and 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 agency just seems connected. It just deeply connected to this. And you know, and I and I'm early days ever. Maybe I'll never know. I, and people like you will help really find integrity behind how the pieces fit together. But I, there just seems to be something there. I mean, one of the things, just if you look at it, that seemed to be a big hole, we've spent billions of dollars on diversity and inclusion training. I mean, any organization worth their grain of salt has been after diversity and inclusion, certainly diversity from the early 90s. And here we are billions of hours uh, of dollars later, you know, years later, and we're, we've got this massive social justice issue, and I don't know how much progress but the, the, the social justice, diversity, inclusion, and belonging all go together in a package. And I just think this was a missing hole in the package. So that's, that's the way we're thinking about it. And it's gonna be maybe a slow burn, but um, I think there's something there. We'll, we'll find out. And, uh, yeah. Lauren, one of the things- Certainly, I, sorry. Oh, sorry. Lauren, one of the things that I really appreciated about our conversations around belonging and what I feel like you educated me on was there are, you know, there's a danger to metrics and data and we have to be aware of that. And so if we talk about diversity and inclusion, those are easily measured in one sense, right? At Quantic, 67% of the employees are diverse. So at one level, I can say that matters and I can make stats either prove or disprove whatever I'm trying to go for. But, you know, in our conversations, you, you know, I feel like you made me aware of the fact that belonging is almost an elevated way of thinking about this. And I think one of the things that feels then very daunting is, okay, well, I may have a diverse team, but do they feel like they belong? Right. <laughs> Or is, is and therefore is diversity really the thing in which I need to be chasing? But how do I measure, you know, belonging, right? And I think that's at the end of the day, what's needed is almost like a challenge that can't easily be answered because it keeps us focused on it, right? If it's a number we can manage, we check the box, we show year over year improvement. I don't have to think about it. Belonging is something I can't ever get there on, you know. Sorry, Kate. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, I think that's I think that's great. Um, I think uh, I I remember you you brought up belonging to me um, a couple of months ago, um, and as it had happened, I had done um, a piece of research for Mizen about how to incorporate diversity and inclusion into one of their diagnostics, um, and the item I chose for that was, do you feel you belong in this organization? That's why so, I called you. you far as you <laughs> Yep. And but the one thing I would say is like in um, philosophical terms, what we would say is that diversity is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for what we're looking here. And um, so you need the diversity metrics. You know, it would be easy to go into an organization where you can imagine that all the people look the same and they all have the same values, that they would all feel they belonged there. Right. But that wouldn't be a socially just right organization really so you do need that diversity and you do need inclusion you do need the idea that these people are included in decision making but then belonging for me is the kind of like almost the cherry on top so you need those things for the cake but yeah you, you do. need the the cherry too yeah, yeah and you know I, and I, i'm a little bit um uh, sheepish around raising this in front of a south african but um i just love the zulu tribe around the way, if I understand it correctly, and I've had people up that uh, uh, Zulus in my, um, uh, in my, in when I was in, up in teaching and stuff, have confirmed this for me that they have this greeting that says, instead of saying hello, they say, hi, I'm Lauren and I'm here to be seen. And the other person says, Lauren, I see you. Yeah, and I, and, and also the, I'm really, really interested in this issue of agency because you, the other part of belonging that has to be completes the picture is that you have to want to belong. You have to bring yourself. You have to show up. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, the burden is on everybody else to make you feel that way. And I just think it's a there's a there's also agency to, that's attached to it. So I'm so curious, Katie, around your research and your thinking 
what you know what insights do you have for us around promoting this sense of, of agency um well one set of theories um that i'm really interested in especially in the context of work um is called self-determination theory and um, so now i'm not a psychologist but these are kind of psychology and um, a family mm -hmm. of theories within psychology um and if i remember correctly um there's kind of three needs that they talk about in self-determination theory and um, that we have the need for i think it's connection and um, competence felt that we we need to feel like we're competent um, and i can't actually remember the third one but i recommend looking into this i'll send some papers around if you're interested um, in it but on the other hand then um as a kantian um i have in mind that however much we feel we determine ourselves um we are inherently vulnerable um, and vulnerability is something that we bring to the workplace too so we bring our desire to determine ourselves to make our own decisions to feel competent and um, to feel efficient to feel connected but we also bring to the table these vulnerabilities um, and the way i describe it so my work is more on this vulnerability side right as a kantian um, and the way i describe it is that we are all vulnerable right um, at, at the most minimal level we're all going to die right we're all made out of flesh and blood and we're all grappling with that um but we're all vulnerable in different ways too um and vulnerability doesn't actually need to be a negative thing in fact as human be beings what what is most valuable in our lives sometimes is given to us because we are vulnerable so concepts like hope for example wouldn't make sense if we were invulnerable a god doesn't hope right mm -hmm. um a god doesn't trust and that's not the kind of thing that a god does because we're human and we're vulnerable we have these concepts and these things that we value um, really deeply you know and um, so the one thing i would say is that vulnerability is not the same thing as precariousness so how i think about it is that we're all standing on a cliff because we're human beings and um, but some of us are closer to the edge than others and um, so we have to think about that right the difference between vulnerability and precariousness and um, so there are my kind of and um, broad brush kind of ideas about, about this. Go ahead, how are you going to jump in? Go. Um, so firstly, uh, okay, it's, I see you and we can do Zulu greetings afterwards. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is, that is absolutely, that is absolutely part of the Zulu tron, uh, tradition. I, I think the thing that I, I'm, amazed by and constantly amazed and i know it's it's very central to a lot of the things that patrick talked about but just the sheer depth of language i mean even in this group we've sat and we've talked about very loaded and i would and i would wonder dangerously maybe ambiguously determined words we've said diversity we've said inclusion we've said hope we've said agency We've said vulnerability. Each and every one of those words in every organization and every individual in every organization, I guarantee you would have an incredibly different definition. And therein is perhaps both the wonder and the abject terror of bringing those words to our organization. Because when I hear Patrick talking about diversity, it's part of me that says diversity of what? of religion, of gender, of age, of thought, because each and every one of those can have merit inside your organization. And some may have more merit than others. But we put a big we put a big sticker on it and we call it diversity and inclusion. And then we don't do the really hard bit beneath it, which means we mean this. Yeah. This is what we mean about diversity. And this is why it's critical here for our people to succeed and for our organization to succeed. And I think that therein, if, if, there's, if there's something I wish we did more of, is get really hard on those definitions so we can manage our own expectations and the expectations of the people around us. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think the best people that, and the best in the sense of the people that are organizations that are most advanced around taking words like that and and soaking them into the value of the uh, uh, statements and fabric of the organizations, not only bring definition, 
uh, but they bring narrative and story to bring clarity, as much clarity as they can, because as you say, if you let the word just sit on a wall somewhere, then it takes on so much different meaning. And I know, Patrick, that's why I think words mean so much to you, because you may say something like, say cheese or try it on, but you've got lots of stories there to bring definition on what the hell you're talking about. And I, I am anxious about a word like vulnerability, because I'm doing some work right now helping an organization determine their great, not perfect leadership system. And I'm seeing vulnerability, authenticity, transparency emerge to the top of the list. And, you know, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, I'm wondering if, if everybody, how much, how much definition really needs to bring to, because that could terrify the heck out of a lot of people if they, you know, what does that mean to be vulnerable? Do I need to get closer to the edge of that cliff, Katie, or do I give a choice in that? Or do I need to jump or, you know, uh, you know, where, and I think that's all part of this. Um, you don't want to make it too academic. On the other hand, there needs to be enough clarity that it's meaningful and you can, you can bring it, you can bring impact from it. I think anyway, I'm curious around your, all your reactions to that. Well, can I jump in for just a second? Because Lauren, you, you know, I was listening to something this morning from David Burkis, which I'm sure is a, a gentleman we're all familiar with. In, in the culture space, you know, and some of these things exist in, in an environment. And he was talking today about vulnerability, but also vulnerability in an environment of candor. And I was quite taken by that. It's, you know, I can be vulnerable in, in an environment of candor. But if candor means you're going to call me a fat bastard, well, maybe I don't need that level of candor. But if you're candid and say, well, listen, Hilton, I need you to improve in these areas, then that's the kind of candor I want. So, again, I'm sort of struck by being vulnerable in and of itself is only half of the equation. It's the environment in which you're vulnerable, where it either takes root or it can be really terrifying. Yeah. And that's the part where I think all the work that psychological safety that Amy Edmondson and those people have done are really been helpful because I think that's the conditions by which you can be vulnerable. And if not, it can be very hurtful. Uh, you know, a lot of people have taken radical candor and turned it into radical meanness. And, uh, you know, it's a, something much different, much different than it, obviously it doesn't, that's not very helpful, but. Well, and that's a good, that's a good segue because my next word actually was safety. And what does safety mean to everybody? So, Katie, I'm going to start with you. Gosh. Um, I suppose not having to be anxious about something and um, not having to think and rethink and worry. Are you sure you're not in my brain? Because that's exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe that's a woman thing. You know what? Maybe that is. Maybe maybe that's sort of a kind of vulnerability question, right? Yeah. Maybe our different ways of being vulnerable make us think about safety in a different way. You know, I think a lot of feminists actually do do work on that. Actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got to I've got to agree. And worryingly, Lisa may go, "Are you in my brain as well?" But <laughs> Um, now, I, I honestly, I, I adore. I think the the clarity of not feeling anxious. I mean, when I when I feel perfectly safe, then I'm not triggered. I'm not anxious. Perhaps safety I equate with calm. You know, and again, maybe that maybe that's only one dimension of it. But when I feel safe, I feel like I can breathe. I can do something without agitation or anxiety. So I'm now in your brain too, Lisa. That's a powerful, powerful word. I mean, obviously 2020 is remembered for a lot of stuff. One of the things that we remember for is the phrase, I can't breathe. Mm. Yeah. That uh, Are you all frozen or is it just me? No, you're oh, back. you're back again. You're back. <laughs> did, I freeze, did I freeze up? Was I lost there or did everybody freeze up? No, we're all good, mate. You're good. Uh, yeah. I was just saying that 2020 is the, 
there's lots of phrases, but the phrase around I can't breathe, that mm -hmm. phrase has got profound profound meaning around what you were talking about, right? Obviously, um, and, you know, in not only from a social justice point of view, but generally maybe how people are feeling overall. Yeah. Patrick, you were to talk about anything? Were you next or? Uh, you know, so when Lisa first said that, I think the the words, the ideas that came to mind is a um, hope, ambition, willingness to take risks. I think I heard it and went to a spot of how do I feel when I feel safe? And when I feel safe, I feel confident, I feel comfortable, I feel this sense of aspiration that I can do something without fear of consequence, right? I'm safe, you know? I'm loved by my friends, my family. I know my I mean, my job is secure, and from that safety, lets me take a risk and for something maybe bigger than myself, for something that I've longed for. And it's in moments of safety that really you can do that in a healthy way, as opposed to a moment of attack or panic. And so there's a much more positive connotation for me in all of that when I hear safety. Well, we have uh, Michael's uh, chimed in and he's told us that safety is the inverse of vulnerability for him. Lauren, what does safety mean to you? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, think, I think it's all the things that, you know, Amy Edmondson talks about in her research and that around this idea that you can bring your authentic self, that you can make a mistake and feel like it's truly a way to move forward and advance and not to get beat up. It's got um, the have to have frank and honest conversations and to ask for and receive help. I think all those conditions yeah. are necessary. The interesting thing that I'm finding is that um, I've never felt more anxiety and fear in organizations that one I'm seeing now in the organizations I'm running into. And, you know, quantum may be an exception because it's growing like crazy and there's just, uh, maybe there's enormous optimism there. I am seeing in a lot of places though, unbelievable um, the anxiety. And I don't know if, you know if anxiety is the other side of, of uh, you know, maybe it's fear, I don't know. But, and I, I'm curious if organizations then are taking on added obligations around creating conditions for for safety. Not 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 that people's jobs are going to be safe because no results, no job. I you know, and I think people get that muddled up. But I'm wondering if it's just taken on, if leadership is, needs to take on more responsibility around those conditions of safety. Well, I mean, Lord, can I can I just? I mean, I'm intrigued by obviously the work that you do and the leadership that you you come into. I mean, you know, there's part of me that wonders, we probably, I, I hope that we could put the leadership mythology of invincibility, we can put that to bed finally. I really hope that in the midst of all of this, this, this mythology of invincible know-all leaders can go away. Because I think that a, a large number of leaders struggle under the yoke of that mythology. I'm at the top of the food chain, ergo I have to have all the answers. Well, here's the thing. No one has a crystal ball that works through a global pandemic. 7.6 billion of us are working our day to day. And your title doesn't give you license to know more than anyone else. But if you struggle under that yoke of, I think I, I, I've been brought up to believe I know everything. Otherwise, how did I get to the corner office? That's an incredible weight and burden. And I hope somebody would just give them a hug and say, it's okay. It's like a moment in goodwill hunting. Let it go. Yeah. You know? Let yeah. it go. So, hey, is your research, sorry, Lisa, go ahead, please. Um, well, I, I was just interested in what you were saying because um, it seems to kind of straddle what I would call as intellectual humility, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so there has been um, massive progress, I think, and in, um, intellectual humility is becoming very popular 
um, right now amongst researchers in all different sorts of fields, but also in, in, in business, I think. And um, so the idea that you don't have to know everything. And um, so humility isn't sort of um, a lack of confidence, right? You can be a very confident leader and also be humble. And yeah. um, humility is actually the opposite of arrogance. What from what you were saying, right? It's it's the opposite of of believing that you know everything um, and believing no one really believes that. And um, so it's more a case of having to pretend that you yeah. know everything. Um, so I think actually the kind of research around intellectual humility is very interesting. And I think it speaks to, to what you were saying. We have a comment from Michael Barrow. Um, I'll just quickly read it out. All this reminds me of a puzzle. Each piece is diverse, each color and shape different, but they fit together. And when they find their place, that is belonging. Each piece has parts that stick out, which is vulnerability. Safety is not extending. So safety and belonging is, is very diverse people coming together to find their place in a greater whole, that is our journey. That's really, uh, really nice. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah. That's, that's good. We're gonna put a belongify brand on it, take that. <laughs> I was Lauren, right Lauren, on Lauren, it's a bit, it's a bit long for a t-shirt, but give me the it weekend. I'll, <laughs> I'll, tear it, I'll tear it down to something. Okay. Well, I, I have one. I have one more word um, before we, you know, we're at the quarter past and, and we go for an hour, so we have fifteen minutes left. Um, and I, this is really a word that I know, Katie. You're going to really have some insights on. And so, the word is identity. Take a drink. Okay. Take a drink. I'm taking a drink. <laughs> um, Gosh, that's uh, that is one that I'm grappling with myself, and I don't quite know what to say because I don't have an answer to that. Um, I think identity is ever moving and changing, you know, um, or identity and how we identify others. And um, it can be quite, um, I don't know, it can be quite um, constrictive to have an identity. And yet it can also be extremely helpful to have an identity because it can make you more safe, right? It can protect you in a certain way. And um, so this is something within my research that I'm I'm really kind of trying to grapple with. What is identity? Um, is it only the sort of thing a person can have or is it something a business can have too? And um, which Patrick talks about a lot and I think is really, really interesting. Um, and is it this, like a, my constant attitude to, towards everything is not to be uncritical, not to accept anything without criticism. Um, so is it necessarily in every way a positive thing or can it have some aspects to it that we have to be aware of? Um, and I wonder, you open to Pandora's box. Yeah, well, and I wonder, Katie, too, though, sometimes, you know, you talk about some leaders and leaders take on the, uh, the assumption and the identity of the business and they lose the identity of themselves. And so what's your opinion on that? Gosh, um, well, in a way, once again, that can have positive and negative connotations, right? Um, so for a leader to care so much that he's taking on the identity of the business, right? And the purpose of the business, I, I mean, that has to be, you know, um, respected on some sense, right? Because at least they're not looking at it as just a way of making money or just a way of doing something. They're taking it on, right? Um, but as you said, right, first of all, it can be completely exhausting. Um, so people talk, I often talk about empathy, that empathy is a great thing, but maybe we should also be critical of how exhausted empathy can make us, right? Yeah. So taking on the very identity of a whole business for one person, that can be exhausting on the person. Um, and also maybe it's not necessarily good for the business too, right? Um, so you're absolutely right. There's, there's different elements of that, yeah. Well, I think of Muhammad Ali, right? He didn't identify himself as the, greater, as the greatest boxer in the world. He identified himself as the king of the world. Which looks very differently, right? Sounds very differently. Patrick, you'd appreciate that because it's very different words with very different connotation behind it, right? Yeah. Patrick, what would you say identity is? That's not a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can say what it is, but what comes to mind is a couple of things. It's it's fluid first. I think your identity 
can change. It changes with time. I think um, we have to understand it that way to ease a lot of anxiety inside of ourselves. Uh, but this is who I am. This is what I'm from. This is what I want to be. The inverse of all those statements brings immense sadness, anxiety, uh, depression at times, anger. I think at the same time, it's it's critical where to understand where do I start and someone else stops. Because in the absence of that, we are all at one sense, you know, atoms bumping into each other in this random circumstance. The fact that the five of us are all sitting here is completely random and, and you know, in some senses, statistically impossible and very possible. And so if I don't know that, um, how do I navigate life with any intentionality? Otherwise, I'm beholden to the needs that are real and the desires, and therefore, I'm not in control of where I'm going. Um, and so, it, it's fluid, it's critical, and I think uh, ultimately, we have to recognize both of those things and then just claim it. Yep. And there's profound power that comes because when you've done that, you now have confidence and comfort and security about you and the relationships. So many of these negative forces in our lives are gone. So, uh, you know, and in all of that, I guess to answer your question, I tend at this far into my thinking, there's three key things. One is identity. There's, there's a, a, an intentional language. There's a decentralized or uh, there's a decision making process and there's a mission or call to action that supersedes me. And then those three components, I, from my own thinking, that's how you, that is what an identity is. But as I said, that's an unfair question. Now, Lisa, can we make sure we have all the questions with Katie? Sorry, what was that? You broke up. Can we make sure that only the tough questions go to Katie? And <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, you know, if, if, if we can, yeah. if, we can make it, if we can make that subtle recommendation. Right. Well, was they're it, not was supposed it, to be tough. <laughs> was it who wants to be a millionaire, phone a friend? Hey, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Don't you ever have me as a phone a friend on the one millionaire. I never get any general question, not a question right, ever. No, it, Even when I know the answer, I don't get it right at the time. Well, Hilton, what does identity mean to you? So I think Patrick's done a wonderful job of explaining the sort of, uh, there's a sort of inherent incongruence with it, yeah. Like there is a fluid evolutionary component to it as you go through life and you and your atoms randomly bump into other atoms. I mean, the fine gentleman wearing a cap in the top right of my screen, I've only known for about 90 days. But I feel like I've known him for about a decade. So that's a, you know, that's a serendipitous bumping of random atoms. And the gentleman in the cap at the bottom, I've known for a couple of years and feel like I've known him almost all my life. Again, random bumping of of atoms, but I do think the one part that I would that I would absolutely agree with Patrick is all identities have anchors or mooring of some kind. You, without some kind of anchors, whether it's a value system, a belief system, a, a, a heritage of some kind, you need some anchors in the ground. Otherwise, you're just spinning through the universe without any. Boring, and I think that, that that is when you have zero identity. Yeah, and I think, I think it's yeah. the boring that are as important as your ability to evolve and grow over time. So if you yeah. can hold those two tensions together, yeah, that that that's my slippery answer. Now can we would go you, to Katie? Would you say I've done this? <laughs> I'm not doing it again. <laughs> when I think of anchors, I think of greatness. Right. Like I think of, uh, you know, when we have an ability to understand and recognize our internal, our, our greatness within us, we have a sense of identity. Right. But what do you think, Patrick? Yeah. I myself and interject on this topic. I think in what, you know, he said, though, there's something so powerful, like one of the, the things I've probably been looking forward to the most this week is this conversation. 
right? These are all my friends. We all, yeah, I, but yet I haven't known any of you longer than 90 days. But without having to necessarily explicitly articulate it, implicitly in my identity is this sense of I care about life and what I do beyond what it means for me. And I want to think about how that impacts other people and what these what mean what it means to others. And that's something I think in all of our identities is true. That's why we all have become friends. And this goes back to the critical need to define it, right? Because when you do that, now all of a sudden, I don't need to have known Lauren or Katie or Hilton or Lisa for 10 years, five years. I've never even need to meet you in person and I never will have to. I yeah. won't. Mm -hmm. But we'll have to when we have whiskey though. <laughs> right. No, I, I, I just wanna, I wanna thank Julia. Yeah. yeah. She's my answer. Thank you, Julia. And we have another answer too. We have Michael. There's three. Who you are? Who are? Who you are yourself? Who you are to others? And how you fit into the whole? So, so Lisa, I, uh, can, can I ask a quick question of Michael? And because he said some wonderful yes. things to say. I mean, I'm delighted. I want to understand what Michael means by how you fit into the whole. And while he's typing that up. I'd love to hear Lauren's answer, but I'm just keen to understand they fit into the hole from Michael, if I may. Yep. Michael, could you answer that for us, please? Lauren, while, while Michael's answering that, what's yeah, it? I, I have to, first of all, tell you, and I, and I was only partly kidding about uh, reaching out for some help from Julia. Talk about finding a friend just in time. I'm actually intimidated by the word. I, I, don't, I don't know why. Uh, I, I, you know, it's like a 50 kilometer uh, road sign and I keep seeing it, but I keep driving by it at 80 and, and, and it's popping up everywhere. And I'm going, I know that word. I know that word, but why am I not digging into it? And, and, um, and, you know, the closest maybe I can come to it is this uh, ever evolving self-awareness with uh, uh, self-compassion, but I know that's totally incomplete. And, you know, and I, anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm like not even, I'm pre kindergarten on thinking about this very well. Anyway, that's thank there you. you. Go, thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. I, well, I, I think between Michael and Julia, we've got to make sure that they're on every other. Truth <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of the matter is, you know, I'm actually going to get their phone number and they can take <laughs> the answers and I can just plagiarize them. I think, I, Michael, think Michael, I think Michael might be a Kantian at heart. Um, yeah. So I think I think there's an aspect of Kant in there, right? The difference between how we seem in the world of causation, how other people perceive us, um, and how we feel ourselves to be, um, and how we take our um, decisions. Um, so I think I think that's a, a real Kantian tension, right? And um, that we have to kind of with every act we um, do, we have to bring ourselves closer to this vision we want to have of ourselves and the vision we want others to have um, of us. So I think it's quite a Kantian notion he has going on there. <laughs> and, you know, I love Mike's answer. You know, it's, it's what I meant in the sense by where do I start and I'll stop, right? Or where do I stop, right? I, I can see it, I've got a line tattooed on my arm as a reminder of that, right? It's so critical where, how do we think about these things? And especially how does the world understand me, right? That is identity. Yeah. One of the things, um, Patrick, that drew me to Kant was this idea of the self and the other. Um, because I love this idea that Kant says that um, other people see us in a way that we will never see ourselves. So in a way, the people around us, in one tiny sense, know more about us than we know about ourselves because they see us as part of this causation. You know, they see us as like three dimensional beings and they see right. our acts, not the sort of motivation that went before the acts, but the acts themselves. Right. And so it, it was one of these reasons that, that drew me to Kant in the first place. I really like that. Is it, he's not a philosopher, but Ken Blanchard, I think in the 1970s writes, mm -hmm. the most effective people have the smallest gap between their awareness of selves and how others perceive them. And so therefore we must become addicted to closing that gap. And that takes intentionality and humility to understand all of that. 
right? And this all goes back to why identity is so important. If we hold what Blanchard said is true, then it points again to this need to know our identity and to claim it. One hundred percent. Yeah. Pretty good for a guy that just uh, didn't want to answer the question. Patrick is quite comfortable in his identity to let <laughs> his eloquence sneak up on you and then when you're not looking, bite you in the ass. <laughs> you're quite comfortable with that, trust me. I know we're getting on, Lisa. But I, do we have time to hear, and I don't know if you can speak to it, Katie, but you know, can you talk a little bit about the work that you're uncovering around measuring culture? Do you, is that? Sure, maybe? I'd love to. Yeah. yeah. Um, Can we dig into that a little bit or? Yeah, we only have a few minutes. Um, okay, I'll try and make this fast. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a hard stop and so do I actually. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, so I suppose I'd start with the idea um, that you have to define your terms, right? So that's one of the things um, that I helped Mizzen with quite early on is to define what is culture? What are we looking to, to, to measure before we actually go and measure it? Um, and then once you do have a definition of that term, right? So um, for us, it's kind of the values and beliefs that are latent within an organization that makes that organization the way it is, right? Um, mm -hmm. So once you have this kind of um, idea of culture, then you're going to have to take a kind of oblique way of measuring it, right? You're not going to, you're not going to go into an organization and just put your finger up and be able to measure culture. Right. And um, so one of the um, areas that I find most helpful thinking about all, all this is the work of a woman called um, Honor O'Neill. Now, Honor O'Neill, she's like my hero, absolute hero. Um, mm -hmm. She is also a Kantian, um, but she she has had a very distinguished um, career. So she's a baroness in the UK, but she's also like a extremely um, respected philosopher. Um, and she works in the practical realm as well. So um, she's done a lot of talks at the Fed in the US, but also the Bank of England. She works with banks and she's looked into kind of what she calls um, trustworthy cultures. What do they look like? Um, so I followed her philosophy on this. Um, so to, to kind of move from this kind of overarching idea of defining culture into how it's instantiated within organizations, I look to what she said about culture being supportive of employees. And um, so culture is that which supports the employees um, to behave and make decisions um, in an appropriate way, right? Um, so I always think about it like um, swimming in a river, right? So if you're um, swimming with the tide, um, you're in a culture that is healthy, right? And it's easier for you to make appropriate um, decisions and to act in an appropriate way, right? But if you're swimming against the tide, no matter how much you are committed as a person to doing the right thing by your organization and by your own sense of ethics, um, it's going to be harder. And in some ways, um, depending on how toxic the culture is, it might even be impossible. Um, and yeah. so then the question is, what are the sorts of things um, that support um, employees to make decisions, right? Um, so for example, psychological safety. Um, so we've done a lot of work on um, taking items from psychological safety and putting them in diagnostics. Um, so the idea is that if you have a um, perceptions-based survey, so a survey that looks at, at employees' perceptions of their culture, you're looking at the employees' perceptions of how supported they are. So you're going to be looking at um, employees' perceptions of whether they belong, for example. You're going to be looking at employees' perceptions of um, how safe they feel at work. Um, and a whole host, we've done a huge amount of work on this, right, to kind of drag from the relevant research um, and to put this into kind of like an, a 50 item diagnostic. Um, and then if you kind of, if, if you, I don't do um, the technical stuff. So this is um, based in with, with my boss at UCC, the behavioral economist. He does the kind of statistical analysis. So if you do that with authenticity and you really do like good statistical analysis out the other end, you should have, you won't measure the culture, but you should have an indication of how supported an employee feels to make appropriate decisions. So that's how we're going to make this. That was very succinct and very helpful. Thank you very kindly. Lisa, sorry, I know I pushed this at the edge. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Normally, you're a deal, but 
Just tonight yeah. I have some, another commitment. Go ahead, yeah. Hilton. Uh, all I was going to say is, Katie, I will take any and all of what that thinking and what it, if there is anything to share around that around that realm, because I think, like Lorne and Lisa, just the notion of understanding the cultures that are created in our organizations has to be ground zero for any transformation, modification, or refinement. And I think, unfortunately, too often we go charging into transformation exercises without understanding the current state. And we sort of brush that under the carpet and go, use for an offsite. Yeah. yeah. You know, why don't we yeah. just take a beat and go, what is the health of the patient before mm, we can exactly. yeah. Is it a marathon or a sprint that we're going to ask them to go through? Yeah. You have to know your culture, right? Yeah. Um, oh. As much as yeah. you can. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I have to go, and and I'm the one who's running the technology. So otherwise, I would just, here you go, you guys go ahead. But <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very very much, Katie. We'd love to have you a, a back as another guest another time very soon. Hilton, take care. Yeah. Lauren, and bye Thanks, for now, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Yeah. Have a good sleep well.